Welcome to the Investor Download, the podcast about the themes driving markets and the economy now and in the future. I'm your host, David Brett. Hello, everyone. In today's show, we're chatting to Martin Wolf. He's the chief economics commentator for the Financial Times. We're going to be discussing the potential fallout from the challenge being presented to democracy and market capitalism by authoritarian alternatives to the former and state-led alternatives to the latter. It's a fascinating listen with some potentially unsettling consequences, but also positive outcomes depending on how it plays out. It's worth saying before we start that the views expressed are Martin's and not Schroeder's. So without further ado, here's my chat with Martin Wolf. Enjoy. Martin, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, just for some people, whomever they may be that may not know who you are, can you just give us a brief bio? So I'm the chief economics commentator of the Financial Times. I have had this role since 1996, which is a very long time uh, indeed, but fortunately for me, my predecessor held this role for even longer, um, Samuel Britton. So I don't feel so bad about that. <laughs> I've been in the FT since 1987. Uh, prior to that, I was in a small think tank called the Trade Policy Research Centre in London. And prior to that, for my first job, uh, I worked for 10 years for the World Bank in Washington. Okay, and you're author of many books, and your latest one is called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. Can you explain what you mean by that? So the book is about uh, the system, political and economic, which has evolved over the last couple of hundred years to be the dominant one of the modern West, indeed the defining one of the modern West, but also increasingly, at least for a time, increasingly uh, influential, indeed uh, powerful in much of the rest of the world. Uh, by democratic capitalism, I mean the marriage of liberal democracy, um, uh, competitive elections, uh, universal suffrage democracy, um, constraining institutions, the rule of law and so forth with market capitalism, by which I mean an economy in which uh, private uh, enterprise uh, and market forces operating in a competitive framework subject to the rule of law are is the dominant way of running the economy. And so democratic capitalism is the symbiosis of these two systems, which have, I think, formed a very successful marriage, broadly defined. Uh, uh, I think the societies that have adopted it have been incredibly successful by historical standards on all fronts. But it's a fragile marriage, and the marriage has gone gone into very significant difficulty. Okay, so this is probably the larger question. Why are we facing this crisis? Well, that's obviously the central question. And uh, first, let's deal with the symptom. I think the, the leading symptom is that a very significant proportion of our populations in advanced democracies, even more so in uh, uh, many emerging and developing countries, have lost confidence in uh, um, the democratic political establishment and often also in the business establishment, the, the, the people who run the economy, uh, and they are looking for uh, particularly new political leaders, um, sometimes also new economic leaders, new new ways of organizing the economy. And the combination has led to a declining legitimacy of democracy itself, to a lesser degree, I think, declining legitimacy of the market system, but it's there too. And this has shown itself most obviously in the emergence of populist politics, by which I mean anti-elite politics, much of it fascinatingly on the right. Was there a certain trigger for this crisis? Was, was there a certain point at which it started to turn this way? Well, there's a trigger for my, my understanding that there's a trigger when it started turning, in my view. Um, 
my own trigger was 2016 because that was when Donald Trump became leader of the Republican Party. It was a scene few could imagine just a few hours earlier. Donald Trump trailing in the polls for much of the campaign, emerging victorious in a presidential result that stunned the nation and the world. All of what a night! It, and, and a, a complete earthquake. This was an earthquake unlike any earthquake I've really seen since Ronald Reagan in 1980. It just came out of nowhere. So it's Nobody a completely different it. face on American conservatism from all its, his predecessors. And of course, it's when this sort of takeover by Boris Johnson of the Conservative Party and turning it into the Brexit Party was also successful. I would like to see a new relationship based more on trade, on cooperation, but as I say, without with much less of this supranational element. But after a great deal of, of heartache, I don't think there's anything else I can do. I will be advocating uh, vote leave uh, or whatever. Good afternoon. This, this morning I, I went to Buckingham Palace and I am forming a new government. And on Monday, MPs will arrive at Westminster to form a new parliament. So here we had the two most significant, long-standing democratic capitalist societies going through some pretty big political upheavals. Uh, then when I look back on the past, I have come to the view that the right way of thinking of the where we how we got here, at least in the economic respects, which I think are very important, though I'm not suggesting that everything, that what uh, happened is there was a long period in which the economy um, was transformed, uh, partly through policy choices, but also through profound underlying economic changes and technological changes, which disadvantaged some previously very important parts of our economy and society and above all the industrial working class. And the second really big thing that happened, more broader still in its impact, I think was the global financial crisis, which was an unexpected, huge economic shock in which the government rescued important parts of the banking sector and the people who working in it. Not a day. The UK's biggest banks are rescued by the British taxpayer. The world's central banks act together to slash interest rates. And yet the International Monetary Fund warns we're facing a major economic downturn. The day began with the bailout. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor making it clear that the financial system is so important to our society that by saving our banks, we're saving ourselves. And uh, this was perceived on both left and right as a as a profound indication that the people in charge were not doing a very good job, and also that our society had become profoundly unfair and uh, and in very different ways. And this eroded confidence in the institutions and and in the capacity of the leaders of our society. Have we seen anything like this in the past at all? Yes, my view is this sort of thing has happened all over the world quite frequently. Uh, the continent where it's happened most often uh, 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 and almost consistently has been South America, Latin America, where populist politics and contempt for what is often seen as a corrupt and self-seeking elite is pervasive. There's a new boss in the land of the bossa nova. The economy went down. We lost, the, you know, a lot of work, jobs, and now it's the time to change, you know. This guy is an honest guy. Jair Bolsonaro took a call of congratulations from Donald Trump and promised to make Brazil great again. In, uh, in European history, the period where populism, if you like, broadly defined anti-league politics, often with, in this case, with an extreme authoritarian aspect to it was, of course, the interwar years um, when fascism became such a powerful set of ideas built around nationalism, social uh, political hierarchy, uh, a, 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 a leader as almost a demigod and a complete uh, identification of the individual with the nation state. 
uh, no, that our period is of course very, very different from that, but it's very, very different. But of course, we, it's also clear that some of the elements we are seeing now in a very watered down and much less ideological and organized way has echoes of that period. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. Is there anything we can learn from the past, or is it just too different these days? I think we can learn from the past in the following way, that if democratic politics and the normal operations of our market society do not give the vast bulk of our population the sense that they matter, that they are going to have a reasonable life, that their children will have a reasonable life, that they're they are that they are respected and valued members of society, that there is a risk, more than a risk, a high probability that they will turn to leaders who uh, articulate both their anger and rage, anger and indignation, perhaps better, and offer them in some way validation and something different, something new, if not a new way of doing things, at least a way of getting back at those they regard as their enemies. Do you think populism and democracy can ever live happily together? Uh, Absolutely. I came to the view that a simple way of thinking about it, this is not original me, is that all populists are anti-elite. That's the essence of populism. But some populists are not just anti-elite, they're anti-pluralist. What they are saying then uh, is that a significant part of the society are not legitimate participants in society. They have no legitimate role. Those tend to be uh, outsiders of various kinds. Um, On the left, they would include capitalists. On the right, it would tend to be ethnic minorities, cultural minorities uh, uh, of various kinds. They are uh, Remainers in Britain, not really legitimate, and uh, they should be removed from the body politic. Their reviews should not be uh, respected, and the institutions that protect them, like the legal system, the rule of law, and so forth, should also not be respected. So you've got this Phenomenon, this is still very remarkable, the famous Daily Mail headline, which referred to the High Court of England, the High Court of England as enemies of the people, because they insisted that a very, very important decision, namely to leave the EU, be ratified by Parliament. Now, I think that's an extraordinary development and indicated anti pluralist uh, populism in a rather profound way, because it was seen as supporting the Remainers. The uh, anti-elite populism is an important part of political renewal. If the elite fails and is seen to fail, then new politicians and new political voices are indeed required. And the populists, identified populists, may turn out to be an agent of renewal and just what you need. And I think the best example of somebody who talked like a populist, who made arguments like a populist, but uh, turned out to act as a force of profound renewal, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision with the present situation of our people impel. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The United Nations have no intention to enslave the German people. We wish them to have a normal chance to develop, to develop in peace, as useful and respectable members of the European family. So there's good populism and there's bad populism. So are we in a cycle at the moment? And if so, at what point of the cycle do you think we're at in terms of populism versus democracy? Well, I think uh, um, 
in this country, it looks at the moment as though populism is on the wane because um, it, it, it didn't work for the Labour Party. Uh, and Corbynism didn't work, which is sort of leftist populism. The issues of social justice and the issues of needs of people will not go away. I want to also make it clear that I will not lead the party in any future general election campaign. I will discuss with our party to ensure there is a process now of reflection on this result and on the policies that the party will take going forward. And on the right, um, uh, neither Boris Johnson nor Liz Trust preserve their credibility. I've got the list here. 45p tax cut, gone. Corporation tax cut, gone. 20p tax cut, gone. Two-year energy freeze, gone. Tax-free shopping, gone. Economic credibility, gone. Mr Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. So we've gone back to normal. This has not yet happened in the US and it still looks very likely that it will continue not to do so. Uh, the two leaders of the Republican Party are both in different ways, clearly appealing to populist sentiments in, in pretty extreme nationalist uh, forms. Today, after four years, the people have delivered their verdict. Freedom is here to stay. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. What worries me more is we may be in the beginning, and I trust may, of what I think of as a Latin American populist cycle, which is a populist is elected because people are truly deeply fed up with conventional politics. The populist fails and is thrown out. They try someone respectable again, that fails, and they go back to the populist. So partly the reason why the the another populist uh, why the, the the respectable person fails is the economy is cumulatively weakened and they can't aren't able to get it back on track and the country that has suffered most from this cycle of any is argentina thousands of people in argentina took to the streets of the capital to express their discontent with president alberto fernandez this comes on the heels of gripping inflation and a prolonged economic crisis in the country now, protesters marched towards Plaza de Mayo, holding banners denouncing the IMF, calling for better and greater social security. It's a sort of warning tale of what happens when you can't get the country back on track. And if you look at Britain, I think worse than America, it seems to me that we, we now have, for very many reasons, a pretty weak underlying economy unable to satisfy people's basic demands for a better life and if the conventional politicians we're now getting more cautious ones like Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are unable to do anything successfully about it and I think it's a very good chance they will be unable to do so then the problem possibility is we'll get a new populist who could be worse. Get in touch with us by email at shorterspodcasts at shorters.com or visit our website shorters.com forward slash the investor download. Against this backdrop right now, we've got the war in Ukraine. Where does that fit into the crisis? Well, I think, um, strangely, it, from this point of view, it's helpful. You know, wars are reality checks uh, in the sense that. They're serious business. They're not a game. Uh, uh, they're frightening. Um, now, this is a war that so far has directly only affected Ukraine, but it's still a an event that involves uh, a war that involves a nuclear power and a, what looks like a rogue nuclear power under a paranoid psychopath. So this is serious politics. And when politics gets serious, you need 
uh, leaders who people will trust as being effective leaders. I, I mean, actually, Boris Johnson did pretty well with this issue. Um, but I think it is possible that uh, this epoch of crises we've had the last three or four years, so after the populist outburst, so COVID, the post-COVID um, inflation. Let's talk about inflation. And there is some good news. It looks like it may have peaked this summer. The bad news, it remains stubbornly high. New inflation numbers out today show prices still high as Americans continue to spend more than they did last year. If you look at core inflation, so if you take out the volatile assets like the price of gas, you see that inflation is still stubbornly high and if not, uh, it is actually going up in many cases. Then the war and the energy crisis has brought back a real desire for relatively competent leadership. And uh, I think we can see that in America with Biden. He's, he replaced Trump partly, partly because Trump was seen as not having handled COVID well. And uh, and uh, um, so these this turmoil um, does create a real demand for competence. Uh, but of course, that the demand for competence has to be met if uh, the populist tide is to is to recede. And is this a case of at the moment East versus West? Is it US versus China, or is it something more serious? Everyone against everyone. Uh, well, now we're getting into the even bigger picture story. <laughs> so the rise of uh, demagogic. Uh, politics in the West is one feature of our world, and it's linked to what's been going on in our societies. And a reason for that, by, and to my mind, very far from the dominant one, has been the other huge story of our time, which is the rise of China. Um, obviously, uh, in the last 30, well, 40 years, but increasingly over the last 20, um, China emerged as a superpower. It emerged with staggering speed. China is the world's second largest economy and the biggest importer. But 40 years ago, it was a poor, largely rural nation, with at least 30% of its population living in poverty. That started to change in 1978, when China launched major economic reforms. You know, one of my famous favorite statistics is back in 2000, the Chinese economy was smaller than the British one. And now it's not so different in size from the American. That's quite something. That's a, it led to massive shifts in global comparative advantage and in trade. It accelerated deindustrialization. That was far from the only cause. And it has created a rival superpower, which is... Uh, an autocracy, a communist autocracy, whatever that means, and clearly uh, with centralized power. So, uh, and it's the an ally of Russia, which has become our enemy. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Moscow for his first visit since Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year. The visit is a clear sign of support for Russia and its President Vladimir Putin at a time when the Kremlin is under intense international pressure. So the... the the significance of that as a global shift is enormous. And in addition to the, so, so the, there's the democratic recession, which is worldwide, but also in our own countries, there's the rise of China, there's the impact of the pandemic, uh, there's the energy shock, there's uh, the climate challenge. Uh, um, there are big sh demographic, demographic shifts in, in all the societies we've been talking about, above all aging. So we are living through a period of exceptionally rapid change. I should have added in all the technological changes we're seeing, AI and all the rest of it, exceptionally rapid change, which is sweeping the entire world and forcing adaptation in our societies, our economies and our politics at a, at a remarkable rate. And it will be reasonable to say we're doing no better than a mediocre, mediocre job of handling it. And it's in that context that we can see and discuss and think about what's going on in our own politics. 
Yeah, and it, it's a bit poor from that sense because bear in mind one of the reasons why China became so big was because they opened up to foreign markets and globalization became a big thing. But it feels like, uh, and it's accelerated during the COVID, but accelerated even more with the war in Ukraine. It seems like we're going back towards protectionism and deglobalization. Where do you think we are in that cycle? We genuinely don't know. Um, so I tend to think of two possible scenarios. It's clear that we're in a cycle in which in trade, and I won't have time to go through all the other, deaths, you know, there's trade, there's movement of people, there's movement of capital, of financial markets, there's uh, movement of ideas, uh, there's trading goods, and, there, and there's trade, virtual trade, all different. But let me just focus on trading goods. Uh, the uh, we clearly ripped past a climacteric uh, of, of the of trade in in goods relative to world GDP. It's it ceased to rise. It's at the most it's basically declining a little relative to GDP since the financial crisis. This is now a well established pattern. I don't really see how that could reverse. The it might, but it will be very extraordinary. We haven't had any significant global trade liberalization, really significant for since the early 2000s, so it's 20 more than 20 years ago. Uh, um, and that doesn't seem likely to change. The general sentiment is protectionist, there are security and defense concerns. Um, but this picture will be one in which. FDI, foreign direct investment between the West and China diminishes because of suspicion on both sides. Uh, trade in the most uh, strategically sensitive areas, high tech areas in particular, diminishes rapidly as does the transfer of technology in those sectors. Um, uh, our internet systems get increasingly separated, our financial systems are separated. So this is decoupling, um, but it would leave a vast amount of trade in ordinary goods, all the things we buy from China, uh, 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 for example, which because they're just cheap and you know, hand tools and surgical masks, and what, that would all continue. And uh, and a lot of Western companies that have invested in China will continue to operate there because it's very profitable. And the co Chinese companies that are here will mostly continue to operate. But sensitive sectors uh, uh, that I mentioned, I should mention uh, also the internet. You know, it's clearly we're moving against Chinese internet companies because we're concerned about the security of information. So there will be clearly sectors that are pulled out, what I think of as the negative list, uh, and FDI will clearly decline. So we get separation, but an enormous amount of trade at a lower level in goods that nobody thinks of as really important will continue, will continue to travel, Chinese citizens will travel here and vice versa. So that would be muddling through as a scenario. Um, but the other possibility is that at some point there's going to be a break, um, a real separation, um, even though many countries will desperately want to avoid that, most likely because there's actually outright conflict, or not most likely, very possible. You know, there's nothing like a war for separating countries. Let's look what's happened with Russia. And then suddenly we're in a world where China and the West are no longer talking to each other, and it could be even worse than that. Uh, so that's the extreme downside scenario. Um, so far, I would say both are possible. Continuing with the status quo ante, you know, going back to where we were in 2008, 9, 7, seems inconceivable. Uh, but how far the decoupling will go, how deep it will be, how devastating and its consequences for the world, I think at this stage, we really don't know. Well, there's, I mean, there's so much there to think about and so many uncertainties as well, but um, how might investors view this crisis? Um, well, this has obviously been, uh, is, and if you throw in, you know, the, the, the more short-term macroeconomic problem of inflation, 
um, in the, the mix. It's been a very, very uncertain time. Given this, I think that asset prices have held up remarkably well. You know, the, you know, the, the markets are more optimistic in their pricing after a relatively modest correction, really, uh, um, given the scale of the turmoil. And I, implicitly, the markets are assuming that we will get back to something close to business as usual, or probably with somewhat higher interest rates, which it justifies uh, somewhat lower asset prices. I mean, higher real interest rates, somewhat lower asset prices. So that's the sort of world that, very broadly speaking, the equity markets are presaging, presaging, and similarly, the bond markets are suggesting real interest rates will be higher. Inflation may be a bit higher, but not much. So these are pretty, the markets are looking to me reasonably optimistic. They are probably well priced for the muddling through scenario that I put forward. Uh, and if that turns out to be the case, I can't see a case for an enormous bull market from where we are, but maybe some recovery. But I think mostly what we've seen is a perfectly sensible correction from bubble type levels. Uh, so if you're going to hold buy and hold for the long term and you believe in this sort of scenario, it will make sense. But uh, I don't see a very powerful bull case here. Um, and of course, if things go really wrong, obviously the war can um, end up much worse than we suspected. Uh, and then we suspect now, um, obviously, uh, it is possible to imagine uh, a war with China as well over Taiwan, which has a lot of similar similarities um, with Ukraine. Um, and that would then be a war between the US and China, essentially. So they, that's obviously um, truly terrifying. Then um, we have uh, clearly very substantial financial risks, the beginning of a, an eruption of a banking crisis. We don't know how far that will go, but it's obviously possible that this could be a repetition of what happened in 2007-09. Uh, debt ratios are still very high. Uh, interest rates have been rising, which reduces the value of the assets of the banking sector. So you could get um, uh, really big shocks to to core parts of the banking sector, and that would be obviously devastating. Um, we have on a you know, smaller end of this, the possibility of serious uh, crisis in the debts of developing countries, which will be less, uh, less um, systemic. And of course, we've, we've learned that um, Pandemics are always possible. We could clearly get another one. Uh, the, there have been really rather a large number of near pandemics in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, actually, the worst one in terms of fatalities was clearly AIDS. Uh, it was a very different sort of pandemic from the recent one. But it's pretty clear that in a globalization, globalized world um, uh, with very large human populations and uh, crossovers between uh, diseases that are present present in animals to us, to humans, and there's a really serious possibility of further uh, pandemics, and they could be much worse than COVID, which is really a relatively mild one. Much milder, for example, than Spanish flu, which is the most similar to one in the last century. Um, and uh, this sort of thing, this sort, this sort of disruption, um, financial war, financial disruption, hostilities, disease, um, these things are always possible. And then, of course, uh, finally, we are in a de deglobalizing episode, um, a period of deglobalization. And any of these disruptions that I mentioned could accelerate uh, the deglobalization as COVID and the war um, between Russia and Ukraine has already done. And if it gets rapid enough, uh, we could imagine the combination of some sort of slump with um, protection leading to disasters. Um, 
uh, uh, so there are some very clear downside scenarios which are quite frightening. Well, that was the show. We very much hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, check out our website, schroders.com forward slash the investor download. You can also get in contact with us about anything in the show or ideas for future shows at Schroders Podcast at schroders.com. Please remember to subscribe to us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave a review. We're now doing one show a week, which will be available every Thursday from 5pm UK time. Thanks very much for listening, but above all, keep safe and go well. Cheers. The value of investments and the income from them may go down as well as up, and investors may not get back the amounts originally invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The information is not an offer, solicitation or recommendation of any funds, services or products, or to adopt any investment strategy. 